9.6 polar coordinates. So in this section we're going to begin looking at a different coordinate system that is another coordinate system for two-dimensional graphing other than the XY Cartesian coordinate system. So of course if we think about the Cartesian coordinate system and we realize that we locate points with horizontal and vertical movement that is movements parallel to the horizontal x-axis and the vertical y-axis then of course when I locate this point I'm locating it with two numbers and that is intrinsic to the dimension of the space. A two-dimensional space is going to have to have two numbers to describe any location no matter what scheme you come up with to do it. So of course the simplest one that we use in mathematics is the Cartesian coordinate system. There is a horizontal move left or right parallel to the x-axis and then there's a vertical move up or down parallel to the y-axis and then of course based on those two values and whether they're positive or negative I locate my point. Okay trigonometry gives us the cue for how to build a slightly different coordinate system. Using what we know from trigonometry I know that if that theta angle is known, that is the angle of inclination of that radial segment above the x-axis, and I know the length of that radial segment from the origin out to that point, let's call it r, then we know from trigonometry that x equals r times the cosine of that angle theta, and y equals r times the sine of theta. And of course that suggests immediately that there's another pair of variables that we could use to locate points in two dimensions and that would be r and theta. That is again if I know the radial distance from the origin to the point that would be the r and I know the angle of inclination that that radial segment makes with the positive x-axis that would be the theta then I can use those two values to locate a point. Okay, what's my notation going to be? Well, I know xy notation is ordered pairs, so that when I write 1, 2, the convention is x is 1 and y is 2. And of course, I do what I'm supposed to do, which is over 1, up 2, I get my point. Okay, with polar coordinates or the polar coordinate system the convention is going to be to write ordered pairs with r first and theta second so r comma theta and so if I wrote an ordered pair in the polar coordinate system uh, let's say 1 comma pi over 2 uh, that would tell me that the angle of elevation if you like or angle between the radial line and the positive x-axis is pi over 2. Well, of course, that means that if I started at the x-axis and rotated counterclockwise pi over 2, I would be pointed in that direction. I'd be pointing up. Okay, let's say I was an observer sitting at the origin. When I first begin, I'm looking out this way. That would be theta equals 0. Okay, once I give you a theta value, which is the second entry in that ordered pair, that tells me to turn in that direction, that is rotate counterclockwise through a positive angle of pi over 2. When I do that, my perspective is now going to be that direction, pointing up. But I'm still sitting at the origin, so I'm sitting at the origin looking straight up. Now this first number, that is the 1 tells me to go one unit in that direction that I'm looking, which means I would move one direction or one unit in the direction of theta equals pi over 2. And let's say that puts me right there. Okay, so what we're saying is, just to be clear here, in polar coordinates, that point we've just located is 1 comma pi over 2. In rectangular coordinates we're saying that would be 0 comma 1 because in terms of simple x and y moves 
I'm still at the normal coordinate or rectangular coordinate pairs 0 comma 1. So that means I have the point 0 1 and rectangular coordinates being represented by the point 1 comma pi over 2 in polar coordinates. Here let's try another one. Um, what if I wanted to locate the point 1 comma pi over 4? Well, what we're saying is we would begin, and this is the way you can think of it, we would begin by pretending that we're looking out along the positive x-axis. In other words, looking out along the line at which theta equals 0. Now this second number tells me to turn counterclockwise through a positive angle of pi over 4. Okay, when I do that, it means I'm now looking out along this line, but I'm still sitting at the origin. Now what does the 1 do? The 1 tells me to move from the origin out along a line segment of length 1, so I'll call that a radial segment, radial segment of length 1. And now my position is one unit away from the origin along this line of inclination with the x-axis of an angle of positive pi over 4. Uh, notice that if I were to draw a triangle right there, then of course this x down here would be r cosine of theta, and this y would be r sine of theta. So that means this x would be 1 times the cosine of pi over 4, which would be square to 2 over 2. And this y would be r, which is 1, times the sine of theta, which is also square to 2 over 2. Okay, so that means what? This point that we're talking about in polar coordinates, we're saying that point would be listed as 1 comma pi over 4 where it's understood that this is a radius value and this is a theta value. In rectangular coordinates, we're saying that same point would be tracked by square root of 2 over 2 comma square root of 2 over 2, where it's understood that these are x and y rectangular coordinates. Okay, let's look at another visualization of this to help us picture it. All right, now notice I've, I've got a picture here of what the grid looks like in the polar coordinate system. And notice that since we're not moving along lines which are parallel to the x or y axes, it doesn't make sense to have the standard rectangular grid. Instead, you can see that I have a series of lines emanating from the origin. Those would be radial lines that make different angles with the positive x-axis. And then of course, if I want to locate something like, let's say, r equals 1 and theta equals pi over 4, then watch what happens when I move the slider. Okay, again, just pretend, and this is probably the way you should conceive this, right now you're the observer at the pole, which is what we call the origin in the polar coordinate system. You're looking out along what we call the polar axis, which happens to coincide with the positive x-axis. All right, what happens when I plot the point 1 comma pi over 4? I'm supposed to turn my perspective by rotating through an angle of pi over 4, counterclockwise. So when I do that, of course, there's that angle that I'm creating until my line of sight is lined up with that radial line. Okay, now what happens, you're still sitting at the origin and you simply move from the origin out along that radial line by whatever the distance r is. The distance for this one is r equals 1. So I would move out to that position, and there's the point 1 comma pi over 4. Notice that if my distance from the origin is 1, I should be lying on a unit circle.
and of course that's exactly where I am. I'm lying on the intersection of the unit circle and that radial line that emanates from the origin that makes a positive angle of pi over 4 with the polar x axis. All right, now, another thing to be careful about in polar coordinates, let me back up this slider, uh, is that that r value, which we've always treated as a positive value in coordinate trigonometry, can actually be negative in the polar coordinate system. So let's make that a negative 1, for example, for a minute. Uh, let's leave that angle theta at pi over 4. And so what's going to happen when I try to plot the point negative 1 comma pi over 4? Well, I'm still going to rotate through that angle of pi over 4 so that once I do, I am looking out along that radial line of theta equals pi over 4. Now, at this point, where are you positioned? You're still at the origin, and you're looking out into that first quadrant along that radial line. What does a radius of negative 1 mean? Well, it means you want to move a distance of one unit from the origin, but the negative indicates that you want to move backwards. Okay, that means if that r is negative 1, and I'm pointing out into that first quadrant, I should actually move backwards into the third quadrant. And I'll move a distance of 1 so that I'm at that position right there. Okay, you should notice then that if that point negative 1 pi over 4 is located over there, that would be the same thing as rotating from the positive x-axis all the way around into the third quadrant through an angle of 5 pi over 4, and then moving out a distance of 1 to that same point. In other words, If this point can be arrived at by rotating out to an angle of pi over 4, but instead of moving in the positive direction, I move backwards, and now I'm referencing that as negative 1 comma pi over 4, what's another way I could get to that point? I could simply rotate from the positive x-axis all the way around to here, which is an angle of theta equals 5 pi over 4. And now I'm still sitting at the origin, but I'm looking out this direction, which means now if I want to get to this point, I would move a distance of positive 1. So I would say another way to write that point is positive 1 comma 5 pi over 4. Uh, you should notice that there are infinitely many ways to write any point in this polar coordinate system. So for example, let's suppose I've rotated through 5 pi over 4. What would happen if I rotated another full turn? Then of course that means I would be at theta equals 5 pi over 4 plus 2 pi, which would be 13 pi over 4. Okay, when I make that rotation, I'm still going to be looking out this direction which means if I moved out in that direction at a distance of positive 1, I would be at this same location. Therefore, I would say 1 comma 13 pi over 4 is another way of writing that same position in this polar coordinate system. In fact, do you see that based on this first point, 1 comma 5 pi over 4 plus any even multiple of pi would get me to that same location. So for example, if I took 13 pi over 4 and added another 2 pi, which would be 21 pi over 4, that would again get me to that same spot. OK, now let's think about another way to do it. So again, we're trying to get to this point where what we seem to be uh, working with is that line where this angle is pi over 4 and this angle is pi over 4. So what's some other ways I could get to it? Well, we also have all the possibilities where the r is negative. So we already talked about this initial one, negative 1 comma pi over 4. So couldn't we play the same game with doing full rotations?
if I got to pi over 4 and then I did another full rotation, that would put me at theta equals pi over 4 plus 2 pi, which would be 9 pi over 4. Well, that means if I make that full rotation plus another pi over 4, I'm still pointed in this direction, which means I'm still at the origin looking out in this direction. If I want to get down to this point, I would still have to move backwards, which means negative 1 comma 9 pi over 4 would be another way to reference this same location. So you're seeing now there are many, many ways to locate the same point in polar coordinates. Okay, before we go any further, let's make a couple of uh, quick observations. Some really simple and useful facts to keep in mind. Uh, number one, let's think about what happens if r equals zero and theta is any value. So if I write the point zero comma, let's just make up an angle pi over four, and let's say I compare that to zero comma, let's say pi over six. Okay, what do those theta values tell you again? They tell you to start in this position where you're looking out along that polar axis, theta equals zero. You're supposed to turn counterclockwise through this angle. Let's say you're doing that, and let's say you're looking out in this direction now. Okay, that's great. You're still sitting at the origin. Then what does this R tell you to do? It tells you how far to move along that radial line in that distance. And if that R is zero, it means you don't move at all. Okay, that means the point that you're going to plot then is actually a point at the pole, at the origin. Okay, so what we're saying here in number one is regardless of what this angle is, if that R value is zero, your point that you're going to plot is just a point at the pole. So we're saying that zero comma theta is just equal to the pole itself for any theta value. Okay, number two, uh, let's, let's write a couple of simple polar equations. So let's put this under the heading of, let's say, two simple polar equations. And of course, we're going to get into graphing all kinds of polar equations, but these are the two simplest ones you could possibly come up with. So number one would be, what if R is held constant? Okay, so this would be akin to asking what happens in rectangular coordinates when you hold the x constant or you hold the y constant. And you know in the case of holding the x constant, you get a vertical line. In the case of holding the y constant, you get a vertical line. All right, so what happens when I hold the r constant? Let's say I look at r equals 1. Okay, what's missing in that equation is the theta. If theta is not there, that means theta could be anything. If theta could be any value, but your r is always fixed at 1, what does that say? It says that you're looking for any point whose radial distance from the origin is 1, but you could be along, lying along any radial line for any theta. Well, if your distance from the origin is 1, it means you're lying on the unit circle. But if your theta could be any value, it means you could be any point along that unit circle. The graph of this equation is the unit circle. The graph of r equals 2 would be a circle of radius 2. Okay, so that means r equals k, where k is a constant, is a circle of radius k. That is, if k is positive. Uh, what if k is negative? So what if we compared r equals 1 and let's say r equals negative 1? Okay, do those produce the same graph? And the answer is yes, they do produce the same graph. However, uh, notice, and we'll talk about this a little bit more in the next video, um, when theta is equal to zero, this one says what? When you're pointing out 
or looking out in that direction along that polar axis that basically makes an angle of zero with that axis. R equals one says you should go out in that direction a distance of one, which would put you there. Okay, what does this equation say? It says, again, if you're sitting at the origin and you're looking out in this direction, negative one for your R value says you should move backwards, which means I'm looking this way to the right, but a negative one R value means I should move backwards over here to the left. All right, now that means as theta increases, what is this equation going to trace out? It's going to trace out a circle in the usual way that we're accustomed to. That is, it's going to be traced out counterclockwise, kind of like your standard parametric equations, cosine of t, sine of t. Okay, what's this equation going to do? Well, it's obviously going to start here. Uh, what happens when you get to theta equals pi over 2? When theta equals pi over 2, you're looking this way, but a negative 1 R value means you should move backwards, which means you would actually end up at this point. So what you should observe there is that I am going to do counterclockwise rotation, but I'm going to be starting over here and going this way. It's the same circle, but it's traced out in a completely different way. Okay, so this shows you I can get the same physical graph uh, from two equations. Look very similar, but they're not the same. Um, we'll get to this more in the next section, but you should notice there's another problem that's going to spring out of this. Um, how do I normally find out the connection between, between two equations, like, say, the intersection? I try to set them equal to each other. And notice if I set these two equations equal to each other, uh, that's not possible. There's no solution. Except I know there's a solution because I know the graphs are actually the same graph. All right, so that means there's a flaw in our usual method of finding intersections of polar graphs. It's not always as simple as just setting the equations equal to each other. And we'll get to that more later. Okay, we said there was another basic graph we wanted to look at. So let's say the uh, number two, the other basic graph. All right, the graph we just talked about is a circle that results when you hold R constant and you let theta be anything you want it to be. What would happen if you held theta constant, let's say theta equals pi over four, and you let R be anything it wants to be? Well, again, if we reason it out, that equation simply says that theta is pi over 4. Okay, that means if theta is equal to pi over 4, I must lie somewhere along that radial line, the one that makes an angle of positive pi over 4 with the polar axis. And we understand that if r was positive, I would land at points up here in quadrant 1, and if r was negative, I would move backwards and land at points down here in quadrant 3. But again, if r is not specified, that means r can be anything you want it to be. If r can be anything we want it to be, then r will be all possible values and fill in everything along that line. The graph of theta equals pi over 4 is a line through the origin that makes an angle of pi over 4 with the positive x-axis or the polar axis. So let's just say in general, uh, theta equals, let's say, alpha, uh, where alpha is greater than 0, is a line through the pole making an angle of alpha with the polar axis. Okay, so again, these are worth mentioning now because they're really simple and have very simple graphs. And again, it is analogous to those two simple situations you have in the rectangular coordinate system.
when you hold x constant and let y be free and hold y constant and let x be free. Instead of getting lines parallel to the x and y axes, what you're getting here are circles for the equations where r is held constant and theta varies and lines through the origin in the case where you let theta be fixed and r be anything you want it to be. Okay, the next thing to talk about, which is a pretty obvious next step, is since there is such a basic connection between these two graphing systems, and of course we see what that connection is, it comes from that little triangle, x, y, r, and theta, x is equal to r cosine theta, and y equals r sine theta. Then the next question is, how do I convert, let's say, polar coordinates to rectangular coordinates and how do I convert rectangular coordinates to polar and of course it should make sense that we've got what we need right here to do that and if I asked you which one of those is the one that's sort of staring us in the face right now uh, you should observe that it is the rectangular I'm sorry the polar to the rectangular the one that I called number one up here. So if I want to convert polar coordinates, let's say r theta, to rectangular coordinates, which we'll say is xy, and I want to know how to do that, these two equations tell me exactly how to do it. It says if I know r and theta, then x has to be r times cosine theta, and y has to be r sine theta. And we're done. Okay, what about the other one? And I'll do an example here in a minute. But what about the rectangular to polar? So suppose I know x and y, and I'm trying to figure out what the corresponding r and theta is. And there's a couple different ways to do it, but let's, let's make it as simple as possible. And again, when I go to this picture, what's the one other thing I can observe in this picture? that x squared plus y squared equals r squared. And so using the equation x squared plus y squared equals r squared, if I know x and y, I can certainly get r. Now, it will be plus or minus, and I know that r can be negative from what we just talked about a few minutes ago. So I'll just say that to figure out or determine which one I should use, the positive or negative, it's going to depend on the location of this xy. So I'm going to take that into account when I try and determine whether that should be a plus or minus. And we'll do that here in an example in a minute. Okay, what about the theta? Well, again, another answer from trigonometry. If this is theta, and this is y, and this is x, then we have a simple tangent relationship between y and x. So I would say the second equation that's useful for getting from rectangular to polar is the one that says tangent of theta is the y-coordinate of your point divided by the x-coordinate of your point. In other words, what's theta? It's the tan inverse of y over x. Okay, so using these two equations, if I'm given x and y, can I determine r and theta? The answer is yes. r is simply going to be plus or minus the square root of x squared plus y squared, and theta will be the tan inverse of y divided by x, which of course I'm given those two values. Now, remember, when you calculate tan inverse, the tan inverse function has a range of quadrant 1 and quadrant 2. And so when I mentioned a minute ago that I'm going to have to take into account where this xy point actually is to determine which of those two values plus or minus is correct, I'm going to have to think about where this xy is and take that into account when I'm choosing the plus or minus here based on what I get for an angle, whether that angle is in quadrant 1 or quadrant 2. Okay, so let's do a couple of examples. Uh, let's do the easy one first. 
which would be polar to rectangular. And this one's uh, pretty straightforward. If I gave you the point 3 comma 5 pi over 6, now here's the thing. I, I would definitely have to tell you that that's a set of polar coordinates. It's probably in, inferred when you see the 5 pi over 6, but you know that could be a point in the rectangular coordinate system. This could be 5 pi over 6, and this could be 3, and I could be talking about that rectangular point. So it has to be made clear either explicitly or in the context of what you're doing that this is actually a set of polar coordinates. Okay, once I know that's polar coordinates, how do I convert that to rectangular? That's easy. I just use my two basic equations, x equals r cosine theta, y equals r sine theta. x will be r times cosine 5 pi over 6 and y will be 3 times sine 5 pi over 6 and that means y will be 3 times sine 5 pi over 6 which is 1 half so this would be 3 halves uh, cosine of 5 pi over 6 is negative square root of 3 over 2 so this would be negative 3 square root of 3 over 2 and so I would say in rectangular coordinates negative 3 square root of 3 over 2 comma 3 over 2 would be the equivalent rectangular coordinate system representation. Okay, let's look at the other direction, which is the one that requires just a little bit more work. Let's say we want to do the rectangular to the polar. And let's say I gave you the point negative 1, 2 in rectangular, and I wanted to know the polar representation of that. And remember that when we're going from rectangular to polar, the two equations we want to use are x squared plus y squared equals r squared, and tangent of theta equals y over x. So of course this one tells me that r squared is equal to 5. That's using these guys for my x and y. This one tells me that the tangent of theta is equal to y over x, which would be negative 2. Uh, to put that another way, r could be plus or minus square root of 5, and theta is tan inverse of negative 2. All right, now, I would start with thinking about where that is. You know that when you calculate tan inverse of a negative number, you're going to end up with an angle in quadrant 4 because the range of the tan inverse function is the closed interval negative pi over 2 to pi over 2, which means you always land in quadrant 1 or quadrant 4. All right, so let's say I've calculated that value, and that means I am pointed down here. All right, now where do I actually want to be with this point? Negative 1 comma 2 is obviously in quadrant 3. That's up here somewhere. So of course, I want to start at the origin, and I want to move out. Let me just move my point. I want to end up there somewhere. All right, but the theta I have calculated from this formula is actually a negative value. So I've done my rotation of theta equals tan inverse of negative 2. Now the key part is what? If I'm pointed in this direction, that is, if I'm looking this way, do I move forward or backward to get to this location? And the answer is I would have to move backward. All right, so what I'm doing is making my rotation clockwise through an angle of tan inverse of negative 2, which is a negative angle, negative theta. And now that I'm looking this way, I will simply move backwards a distance of square root of 5, but that really means r has to be negative square root of 5. Okay, so one of the many representations I could write for this point in polar coordinates would be r is negative square root of 5, and theta is tan inverse of negative 2. Uh, but as we pointed out before, 
uh, you should be able to construct from that one many other different representations. Uh, so for example, what would happen if I changed that angle from tan inverse of negative 2 to tan inverse of negative 2 plus pi? Well, tan inverse of negative 2 plus pi, I'm sorry, minus pi is what I meant. Uh, where would that angle be? Well, tan inverse of 2 is right there. If I subtract another pi, it would put me around here, which means I would be pointing this way, which would change this to a positive r. There's another representation. Okay, by doing half turns or full turns, I can get many, many different representations. And what you should be seeing from this example is that if I do a half turn, I can actually change the sign of the r. That's what determines whether the r is positive or negative. Am I going to move in the direction I'm facing, or am I going to move backwards? Uh, doing a half turn will reverse that direction you need to go to get to a point. Uh, these would both be correct. They're just different answers. Same location, though. Okay, that's a couple of examples of converting point locations represented in one coordinate system to the other coordinate system. The next thing before we eventually get to graphing would be to look at how do I convert equations from polar to rectangular or vice versa. That is, if I see an xy equation, I know that's a rectangular equation. I graph it by plotting points in the xy coordinate system that satisfy that equation. If I see an equation that has r and thetas in it, it's going to be understood that that's a polar equation, which means the points I plot that satisfy that equation will be r theta points, which I graph in this new polar system. So for example, let's look at this example just to show you what I mean. Uh, let's say we have the polar equation of r squared equals 4 sine of 2 theta. Now, you know, the question might uh, be posed here, why would I convert rectangular to polar or polar to rectangular? Uh, depends on what I need to do with it. Uh, is you're going to see with the graphing that we're going to do shortly and then when we eventually make use of this uh, at, at greater length than Calc 3, uh, there are some graphs that are much better described with polar coordinates than rectangular coordinates and vice versa. Um, think about the, the version or the, the equation we talked about a few minutes ago for a circle. What's the equation for the unit circle in polar coordinates? It's r equals 1. What's the equation for that same circle in rectangular coordinates? It's x squared plus y squared equals 1. Okay, this is not a super complicated equation, but you can see the relative difference between the complexities here is, is making this one on the right quite a bit more complicated than r equals 1. Um, you know, what about theta equals pi over 4? Well, that's y equals x. This is just the line through the origin, makes an angle of 45 degrees with a positive x-axis. That's what this one is, too. All right, now those are the simple ones, but of course, as we move into more complicated graphs, uh, the disparity between the complexities here can get pretty, pretty large, pretty stark. And sometimes the polar equation is going to be much simpler. Uh, sometimes it's the rectangular. Sometimes, even if the polar equation is not too complicated, which, you know, this one here is, is not super complicated, but I don't have any idea what the graph of this thing is. Uh, perhaps if I convert it to rectangular, uh, it might be more recognizable in rectangular form. And that could also be true with a rectangular equation that's hard to recognize. Maybe when it gets converted to polar, it's something simpler, at least simpler to recognize. All right, so let's look at this one. Um, and this example will give you ideas for a couple of the big tricks that we use in converting polar to rectangular. Uh, the first thing you should think about doing is converting that sine to theta. Uh, 
Uh, when you think about identities, you know the first one that should pop into your head is sine of 2 theta is 2 sine theta cosine theta. Okay, wh why is that important? Because I know my two basic equations for converting polar to rectangular are the ones that contain just basic cosine and basic sine. I really don't want more complicated arguments on those sine or cosine functions. So if I can get rid of something like an argument of 2 pi by using a simple identity, I will. So r squared equals 4 times 2, so that's going to make 8, times sine theta, cosine theta. Now, what's the next thing to keep in mind when you're going to working with equations like this? I love to see r cosine theta and r sine theta because I know those get me x and y. Okay, there is definitely nothing wrong with multiplying this right side of the equation by an r and by another r, and obviously that gets me a y and an x. I just have to do it to the other side. So what I've really done there is multiplied both sides of the equation by r squared. Okay, what's my equation now? It's simply r to the fourth equals 8, and we said this would be y and this would be x, so 8xy. All right, now, what do you do with that r to the fourth over there? Well, again, what was your other equation that related x, y, and r? It was that Pythagorean x squared plus y squared equals r squared. Okay, that means this left side of the equation is definitely just r squared squared, meaning it's x squared plus y squared squared. And so be look on, on the lookout for things like this. Even powers of r are a good thing. Uh, the presence of sines and cosines as factors is a good thing because you can simply multiply by r's to get r sine thetas and r cosine thetas. Okay, what is this guy? He's going to be, if we expand that out on the left, looks like x to the fourth plus 2x squared y squared plus y to the fourth minus 8xy equals zero. All right, now for this particular equation, it just turns out that I don't really get an equation that has a graph any more recognizable than this polar equation. And for one like this, I'm going to have to resort to other methods here to figure out what the graph is, and we'll see those shortly. And we will see examples where converting an equation in one coordinate system to the other helps. I did this example just to walk you through a couple of the tricks for doing the conversion, but this also shows you sometimes you really don't get anything any better. Okay, let's do an example where we go the other way. Let's take a rectangular equation like x squared plus y squared minus 4x equals 0. And you can tell that I'm doing something uh, easy here in this example. You should recognize that that's a conic section. Since you see x squared and y squared terms, and they're both the same sign, and in fact they have the same coefficient, that tells you this is a circle. All right. How do we deal with these normally? If I was going to uh, try and figure out what the circle is, uh, I would complete the square in x, since I have an x squared term and an x term. So I would look at it as x squared minus 4x plus y squared equals 0. I would complete the square and have x squared minus 4x plus 4 plus y squared equals 4. That's adding 4 to both sides. Now I have a complete square here which would be x plus 2 quantity squared plus y squared equals 4. And I recognize that that's a circle with its center at negative 2, 0, and a radius of 2. So in other words, it's a circle with its center at negative 2, 0, and with a radius of 2, that means... It's going to be a circle that touches or grazes the y-axis there at the origin. And so I would say this is a circle 
that's tangent to the y-axis at the origin. And so this is radius 2 circle. Okay, what would this look like if I converted, to, converted it to polar? And can we confirm that this uh, interpretation we've got down here in this picture makes sense? Well, first of all, uh, this part is simple. I know that x squared plus y squared should just be r squared. Okay, I also know that x is r cosine theta. So if I make that substitution, I have r squared minus 4 r cosine theta equals 0. Um, notice that since there's a factor of r in each term, I could factor that r out, and that would leave r minus 4 cosine theta. And we can actually do solving by factoring here. That equation tells me that either r is 0 or r is equal to 4 cosine theta. All right, now r equals 0 would be what? Uh, it's any angle, any theta you want, but r equals 0. And we said earlier r equals 0 means you're at the pole. The graph of this equation would be a point at the pole which is clearly not the graph we're talking about. Okay, that means that's an extraneous equation. That doesn't match the actual equation we're after. Okay, what's this one? Well, that must be the circle we're after. And we'll go through some of these in more detail in a minute here, but let's just do a rough sketch. And this is how I could put together the graph of something in polar coordinates. Uh, let's make a table. And let's look at theta and r. So if theta is 0, that would be 4 times cosine of 0, which would be 4 times 1, which would be 4. And I just realized, you probably caught me several minutes ago, but uh, I'll just fix it right now. Uh, I made a little sign mistake right here. When I factored that, that should have been an x minus 2 which means my circle is the right shape, but it should be over here. It should be still tangent to the y-axis, but it should be centered at 2, 0. Okay, of course, how did I catch myself well, with such a silly mistake? I can see right here that when theta is 0, I should be sitting at positive 4. In other words, I should be sitting out here, and this is clearly not right. All right, so I caught myself. That was not intentional. Let's redraw this picture. So we're saying circle with a center of 2, 0, radius 2. So something like this, roughly. All right, now notice when theta is 0, which means, of course, that I'm pointing this way, r equals 4 would put me right there. Okay, what happens when I look at, let's just pick something like, uh, let's say, pi over 3, and I'm picking a number there that gives me a nice cosine value. Cosine of pi over 3 is 1 half, so that means r would be 2 when I'm sitting at pi over 3. All right, now... What direction is pi over 3? Well, it's roughly, and this is, when I say roughly, I do mean roughly, it's somewhere out here, which means I'm sitting at some point like this. Okay, that means so far I've rotated up to pi over 3. What would happen if I rotated to sort of the next natural thing, which would be pi over 2? If I put in pi over 2... Let's see, I get 4 cosine of pi over 2. Cosine of pi over 2 is 0, so this would be 0. In other words, what happens when I rotate to pi over 2? My radius shrinks back to 0, which means I'm here. And so you can definitely see I'm following the arc of the circle with these points. Now, of course, what's going to happen when I go from pi over 2 to pi? Well, I'll let you notice that by the time you get to pi, 4 times cosine of 
pi would be 4 times negative 1, which would be negative 4. All right, meaning what? By the time I've rotated to pi, which means I'm pointing out in this direction, instead of leaving the origin and going to the left, that radius of negative 4 says that I should go backwards. And if I go backwards, negative 4, I'm going to land back here again. Okay, what that means is from 0 to pi over 2, I traversed the top half of the circle. And from pi over 2 to pi, I traversed the bottom half of the circle. Meaning, if I was thinking this in terms of parametric equations, I just traced out this circle with an interval of 0 to pi. So I would say this has period pi. 0 to pi gets me one full trace of the curve. So actually, if I tried to graph this and I went from 0 to 2 pi, I'd be going too far. I'd be tracing it twice, going twice around counterclockwise. All right, so you know which one of these was easier? I think probably still for this one, the rectangular, because we're so accustomed to recognizing those conics, and we know how to complete the square and turn it into something that's very easy to interpret. Uh, but when we did convert this one to polar, we did get a simple equation. And this is one of the basic equations that will be listed in your book. That is, when I have something that looks like r equals a positive constant times cosine theta, that will end up being a circle that is tangent to the y-axis, sitting on the right side of the y-axis. And again, what was this for? Um, half of that was the radius of this circle. So I would say this is a circle that is tangent to the y-axis on the right side of the y-axis with a radius of a over 2. OK, let's do another one that involves conics. So let's look at r equals 6 over 2 minus 3 sine theta. And I'm doing this one just to show you that uh, even though we get some nasty numbers, if we take our time and use what we know about converting polar to rectangular, um, even when the numbers are a little nasty, we do end up getting something more useful sometimes when we convert polar to coordinate or polar to rectangular, especially if it ends up being a conic section, which is what this one is. All right, again, though, what should be my general strategy for putting this uh, into rectangular form? Well, it would make sense to clear out the fraction first. That just makes algebraic sense. And when I do that, right away, my eye goes to that r sine theta. And I know immediately that that's a y. So this is 2r minus 3y equals 6. All right, now, what's that r? Again, we know x squared plus y squared equals r squared. So we know r equals the square root plus or minus of x squared plus y squared. Now, I, I don't really want to replace that r by that square root of x squared plus y squared if I can help it. What's the way around that? It would be to square that r. If I could square that r, then that r squared would just become an x squared plus y squared. OK, that's easy. I can definitely square this term that contains the r. And if I was going to do that, it would make sense to get everything else on the other side of the equation. So if I put everything else on the other side of the equation, in particular, if I said 2r equals 3 times y plus 2, then I could certainly square both sides now and get 4r squared equals 9 times y plus 2 squared. And that's great because there's that r squared that I'm after. So this is 4 times x squared plus y squared equals 9 times y plus 2 squared. And I definitely recognize when I do a little distribution here that that's a conic section. Um, now, in fact, even though this is nicely put together here, I'm really going to want to break that apart so that I can combine the y squared term in that with the y squared term over here. So let's go ahead and do that. That would be 9y squared plus 36y uh, plus 36. 
And so if I move the y squared and the y term to the left side, uh, looks like I would have 4x squared minus 5y squared minus 36y equals 36. It would certainly make sense at this point to complete the square there. So I'll call this 4x squared minus 5 times y squared minus, actually, plus 36 over 5y. And I know what to do to complete the square now. Inside the parentheses, I should take half of 36 over 5, which would be 36 over 10. And I know 36 over 10 reduces to 18 fifths. So I would want to square that and get 324 over 25. So I'm going to have y squared plus 36 fifths y plus 324 over 5, 25. 324 over 25. Let's try that again. Now, of course, when I insert that, what am I actually doing? I'm actually subtracting 5 times 324 over 25, which is negative 324 over 5. So since I'm subtracting that number on the left side of the equation, I would want to subtract it on the right side as well. And you can think of that as adding 325 over 5 on the left or subtracting 325 over 5 on the right. And I don't know why I keep saying 325 when that should be 324. All right, what does that give me? It gives me 4x squared minus 5 times y plus half of 36 over 5, which was that 36 over 10. That was that 18 fifths. There is my perfect square equals on the other side 36 minus 324 over 5 and if I did my calculator work correctly you get minus 144 over 5. Alright now how do I get this into formal conic equation shape? I know that I need to get this guy to be a 1 which means I should multiply by negative 5 over 144 on both sides Okay, if I do that, I'm going to get on this side, of course, 1, which is what I'm after. So I think we're going to get negative 20 over 144x squared plus 25 over 144y plus 18 fifths squared. And of course, that 20 over 44 can be reduced, but I won't bother doing that here. I will just point out that this does look like, uh, let me turn this around for you, let me call this y plus 18 fifths squared over 144 over 25 minus x squared over 144 over 20. Okay, and I did that just to emphasize to you that this is a hyperbola. It's a hyperbola where the focal axis is the y-axis. And again, I know that because it's the y-squared term, the term that has the y-squared in it. And I really wrote that funny, didn't I? Let's try that again. There, that looks better. Um, that's the term that's positive, the one that has the y-squared in it. And that tells me which direction this hyperbola opens. So it's an up and down opening one. But what I can clearly see now is that a squared is 144 over 25, which that means a is a very nice number, just 12 over 5. b, not so much. b squared is 144 over 20, uh, which means b is 12 over the square root of 20, which is doesn't come out round. But I can definitely grab my a and b values from there if I needed to get c, I could. But the main point is I recognize that this is now a hyperbola that opens up and down, so its focal axis lies along the y-axis. And I can tell that the center, 
of this hyperbola is x equals 0, y equals negative 18 fifths. And this is just a long-winded example just to show you that uh, navigating uh, you know, some ugly numbers is not that big a deal. Uh, the main point would be trying to resolve this into something useful. And of course, once I play with this equation a little bit, uh, by the time I get to you know, one of these lines up here, uh, let's say this line, I can see that this is a conic section. And I know I'm on to something. I know if I keep going, I can get an equation that will actually allow me to graph this if I really needed to. Okay, so that's section 9.6, and that's the basics of the coordinate system and how to actually do some conversions of points and equations in one coordinate system to points and equations in the other coordinate system. Uh, we'll save the graphing of equations and the introduction to that for 9.7, and that will be the next video. So we'll stop here with this one.